All right, so I, I just uh, pulled up uh, a quick little list of the books of the Bible in order because I saw some people having trouble getting to Jonah. It is tricky sometimes to navigate the Minor Prophets because they're small. And so you flip past them real quick and you got to go back. And so it does pay to know the Minor Prophets in order. And the order is Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. I kind of like the rhythm of that. It like almost rhymes. You know, it's got kind of a... I, I want to almost rap it. Like Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. Right? It's, you can remember it however you want if you don't like rapping. And, but that's... It, it, and you can also look up in your table of contents. Tables of contents are good. Um, the important thing is to do it. Even if it's hard, do it. Open in a physical Bible. Bring your Bibles to church. We're going to use them every week. Um, and uh, it'll, uh, you'll get better at it the more you do it. But uh, yeah, I just, I just wanted to throw that up on the screen to start us off. And then let's open. So I'll, we'll start where we last left our heroes, which was the end of Jonah 1. Jonah has been cast into the sea from the boat where he was running from God. And 17 begins a cliffhanger that the Bible left us on last week. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. The word provided is interesting. Uh, it, it, it makes sense in the context of the story because Jonah was going to die and instead was swallowed by a fish. But normally you would think of, oh good, you know, the Lord provided me a, a large fish to swallow me. It would be a good thing. It was in Jonah's case. Um, we also talked a little bit about this three days and three nights thing, which became a very big deal to Jesus in Matthew chapter 12, where Jesus said, I will give them no sign but the sign of Jonah, for just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. Now, there is a little bit of a balancing act I want to play when we do that. Um, because if you remember, way back when, when we first got started looking in Habakkuk, I had a board and I talked about a couple of pitfalls um, that we often, that often make it harder for us to enjoy the minor prophets. Um, we want to treat them like Torah uh, or gospel, which are often narratives, the minor prophets are often not. Um, we want to ignore the discomfort that we might feel reading Minor Prophets. So if we see things that make us question, make us doubt, make we just don't like, we, we tend to try to be in denial about our dislike and say, I can't possibly be not liking this. This is the Bible. I have to find a way to like it, right? Uh, and I think it would be better if we feel the feelings that it makes us feel, right? Just like, you know, when you're listening to an album and you get to a sad song, You'll enjoy the album more if you let the sad song make you feel a little sad. You know, if it's trying to make you feel sad, they're doing something with that. So trust it a little more. And then the third thing, which is kind of a function of that, is we often treat the Minor Prophets just as an Easter egg hunt. And we say, okay, can I find a verse? Can I find something in here that says that, uh, that the Messiah is going to come, that, that, that Jesus is God? And then, then that'll be the main point of the book for me. And the answer to that is almost always yes. Yeah, you can find that, right? We can find that in Habakkuk. Habakkuk says that, uh, you know, the, the Lord's going to send the Babylonians, but eventually the Babylonians are going to get their comeuppance, and the righteousness of the Lord will cover the land as waters cover the sea, that, you know, there, there is a, a new day that is coming. This is similar to the day of the Lord. We can do that in Nahum which we read together, Nahum says, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. But there's also so much other stuff in those books. And if we already know Jesus is Lord, and we already have books like the Gospels that do a much more complete job <laughs> of telling us who Jesus is, 
um, it would be a shame to just coupon cut that little verse out of the Minor Prophets and waste the rest of the books when they've got other stuff to tell us. So in that way, I want to be careful not to just use the three days and three nights and say, oh, so that was there. The reason that was written is to tell us about the tomb. But, <clears throat> I'll just give it, I, I don't mind, I, I forget to turn my phone off all the time, but I, I don't want to distract other people. But, um, the, the reverse is also true. I think, in some ways, we can use the tomb to help us understand Jonah. Um, and so if we want to say, okay, it's good, you know, Jesus died and rose again. If you didn't know that, that's important information, right? <laughs> but in addition to that, Jonah dies and rises again, is what Jesus says. So what, what we're reading, this story is, in a weird way, in an indirect or metaphorical way, a resurrection story. And we want to carry that lens with us as we continue to read the book. Any other thoughts, comments, feelings, things you, you, you didn't get a chance to say last week or have bubbled up since then about chapter 1 of Jonah before we open up chapter 2? No. Good. Clear. Everything's clear as mud. Let's go to chapter 2. Uh, now, I mentioned briefly the authorship of Jonah is uh, something people debate about a little bit uh, because it's written in third person. Most of the other prophets will say, you know, I, I Micah, you know, and here's the message I have from the Lord. Uh, Jonah says, well, this is what happened to Jonah. Um, and so it could be Jonah writing in the third person. There's no rule against that. You can, my daughter talks in the third person all the time, right? Liddy wants juice. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but it might also be another author. And, and some of the reasons people are uncomfortable with the other authors, number one, we don't know that other author's name. So it kind of, I don't know, just makes it feel less legitimate somehow because it doesn't say, so we don't know. But the other thing is that it's called Jonah. And so I, like, usually you call it the thing by the guy who wrote it, and so, but regardless of who wrote chapters 1, 3, and 4, chapter 2 is mostly Jonah talking. So we've got a bit of Jonah in Jonah. We've got a bit of the words straight from the horse's mouth. And it's going to be, I mean, you, you should notice already, if you compare chapter 1 to chapter 2, there's a difference there, even before we read anything. You notice the difference. Just the way the words are formatted. Someone's using the enter key a lot more often. No? Nobody else? Is, is, is it not that way in your Bibles? It is. They're shorter paragraphs. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. Pa paragraphs is a strong word. Uh, <laughs> half sentences. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it is, if it is not like that in your Bible, that's okay. It is not like that in Hebrew. Um, in the ancient world, we did not waste paper. So you would write, you know, you, you'd have no margins. You'd <laughs> begin at the top of the page, and you write clear to the end of the page, and, and you, don't, you don't waste space with line breaks. Um, but in most English Bibles, we will add line breaks, add tabs, add uh, hit the enter key more often, and, and put white space on the side of the page. When things are in verse, when things are songs or poetry, um, just to kind of show that. And in Hebrew, you would show that by your word choices, but we can't see the specific word choices. We're looking at translations. So our English translators do us a favor and they give us a kind of hint to say, hey, this is meant to be read with a, with a meter, uh, with a certain rhythm. Um, and we can tell that by how it's written. We don't necessarily know what the meter is, um, but, but it's a different 
We've switched genres of literature. We've switched writing styles when we enter, well, a minute after we enter chapter two. So it's narrative, it's narrative, it's narrative. Jonah gets swallowed by a fish. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord from the belly of the fish, saying, and he's speaking in, in rhyme. He's speaking in poetry. This poem is what is recorded from the mouth of Jonah. I called out to the Lord in my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. Let's stop there. I want to try to go intentionally slow. Any questions, comments, insights so far? Mine says, from deep in the realm of the dead, I call for help. Mm. And you listen to my cry. Yeah. So from, from what I could read, Jonah thought he had died. Mmm. Read that again, Joe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, starting at the top there, it says, In my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help and you listened to my cry. Yeah. So, so what is shale? Does anybody know? It, it, this is, we call this a transliteration. So it's just a Hebrew word that we didn't actually translate. We just switched the Hebrew letters for English letters so that it would make the sound of Hebrew. Um, he answered? Which is what we often do with like proper names. Of the, uh, so Sheol is hell. Sheol is, I mean, it's not identical to hell, but it is, it is the realm of the dead. It is what was believed in the ancient world. Um, you, where you go when you die. Um, unlike hell, it is where both the good and the bad people go when they die. <laughs> um, it's just a, so more like, if you know Greek mythology, more like Hades. You know, it, it would be presumed that there'd be a, a nice neighborhood in Sheol and a, and a nasty neighborhood in Sheol. But, uh, but it's all Sheol. It's all the pit. Um, the, the place of the dead. So, your translation, Joe, is choosing to find English words, use multiple English words to explain the same meaning as the, the one Hebrew word. Well, this yeah, translation is if, if just read, uh, throwing you the Hebrew word. Down below that, though, <clears throat> when, when he says the realm of the dead, he may mean like the earth. Because it says down below, and I, I didn't remember that, it said mm -hmm. uh, Jonah pictured his predicament in the belly of the fish as though he had been buried alive. So he, mm -hmm. he, he didn't think he was dead, but he, he thought he had been buried alive, which would be about as bad. I mean, we, we are very much playing in those spaces, right? Like, Jonah's experience, both for Jonah and for Jesus, uh, is likened to death and, and afterlife and, uh, yeah, and so, so it is, it is kind of sort of death, right? It's not identical to death, but, but it is very much in that realm. Um, it's, it's very much uh, something we can talk about in those terms. Um, I, I hesitate to keep overusing the word metaphor because metaphor in some ways can be controversial in biblical critics and circles because you know, some people want, some things, want everything to be literal, including the metaphors. And, and anyway, it's just a language game, but, but it's a literal metaphor, right? Yeah, Jonah's experience, he, he uses a word and he describes it as being in the belly of death, being in the belly of, the, of Hades, of 
the grave. Uh, sometimes you see shale rendered as grave. It just it's the place of the dead. It's the place you put the dead. Um, and that's his word that he uses to talk about, you know, the black water closing in over his head. It's like being buried, but underwater instead of dirt. Yeah, go ahead. In chapter one, he don't want nothing to do with Jesus at all. Yeah. Now, now we need to. Now he's, now he's in, now he's in a predicament. Yeah. Now yeah. I'm praying. Happy Lord, get out of this mess. There you go. You've heard that phrase, there are no atheists in foxholes, right? <laughs> <laughs> I agree with, with uh, Joe, how he felt like he was at least at death's door. Yeah. And, and like, how far and how near we are to the literal experience, right? I mean, presumably, Jonah really thought he was going to die. And then at some point opens his eyes and he's not dead, but maybe he thinks he's in the afterlife. Literally, you know, maybe he... And I don't know that we can, we can get all the way there to know exactly at what moment what was going through his brain. And what, but the, yeah, that that's, that's the game, right? That's the, that's the territory that we are swimming in. No pun intended. <laughs> I also want to say on, on David's kind of observation, I encouraged you to pay attention in chapter one to what a bad prophet Jonah was being, um, and, and strangely bad in some way, right? Disobedient, effective despite disobedience, <laughs> um, because he, he managed to witness to uh, the people on the boat against his better efforts, <laughs> avoiding telling them about God, start begging him to tell them about God. Uh, and I want to ask the question, so now he's writing a prayer in verse. Now, now he's, he's giving us poetry. And I think there are multiple ways to read it. And I'd be interested in what, I know some of you have commentaries printed inside your Bibles. You have you know, footnotes and study helps and things. Is this the really talented prophet coming out and blossoming, you know, it's kind of, you know, heat and pressure makes coal into diamond, uh, or is this a desperate man kind of doing the best he can with a, with a bad situation, um, and this is actually kind of a mediocre prayer that we would all pray if we were in such a situation of being miraculously saved. I, I, I hope you kind of keep that question in your mind. Like, is this amazing poetry? Maybe it's a little bit of both. Or, or is it, maybe it's a little bit of both. Yeah. I, I, I think, you know, I think it's sometimes interesting to, there's a, there's a great verse in Job that I really like. Um, when, when God answers Job, and one of the things he says is, Job does not, uh, just as thy tongue tastes good food, does not thy ear taste truth? Sometimes I think it's, it's interesting to kind of try on an interpretation, see how it fits, um, see if it's you or not, see, see where it takes you, and then you can, you can take it off and try on a different interpretation if you want to. It's, it, where could we go with this? Let's, let's taste it. Let's just... Um, and anyway, I, I think it's, yeah, and, and it could be a mixture, and it could be a third thing, too, that I haven't thought of. Let's go to verse 3. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. One of the things that I um, have made a point of in St. John's, uh, when I talk about the Psalms especially, is that Hebrew poetry loves parallelism. Parallelism is when we say the same thing in different words. And so you'll notice, um, I called out to the Lord in my distress. Out of the belly of Sheol, I cry. So distress is like Sheol. Um, called out is like crying. You see how that's the same thing in different words? He answered me. He heard my voice. 
Same thing in different words. You cast me into the deep. What's another word for the deep? The heart of the seas. Um, the flood surrounded me. Your waves and billows passed over me. If, so he's, he's repeating himself. But not in a redundant way. In a illustrative way. And in an artistic way. He's doing, he's doing fancy things with words to evoke feelings and emotions in you. Um, and even though this is a translation, I think we should pay attention to those feelings. Um, any other comments on verse 3? Shall I move on? I think I'm going to move on. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I look again upon your holy temple? What do you think is going on there? That God casts them out? It, what do you, community? What do you think? <clears throat> well, it's kind of like when he thought that he had been buried away. I think he kind of thought he'd been thrown away. Because yeah. He, because he had defied God and God said, I'm through with you. Mm hmm. He, he disobeyed, and now he's being punished. But where he is right this minute, in verse 4, and it's not going to be where he is at the end of the chapter, is, I have sinned too much, God will never forgive me. At, at, at least that's my, my assumption. I, that, that's kind of, that's how I read it. I also think there's, there's some literalness to this, which is that I'm, I'm deep underwater, uh, I'm never going to make it back to the Temple Mount to, to give a sacrifice to, uh, to repent, right? I, I, can't, I can't bring a sheep. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, there's this, um, this sense of desperation and unworthiness. Um, I, am, I am driven away from your sight. I am ineligible to be close to God. Too dirty, too sinful, too wrong. <clears throat> so what is the holy temple? And then he says he'll look toward the holy temple. He looked toward the holy temple. Uh, where do you have that? Uh, is that in four for you, or is that no, further down? Four. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have. How shall I look toward the holy temple? Mm -hmm. uh, but which which translation have you got? That's that's an interesting. I mean. You know, we, we can play differently with the Hebrew word. I'm just, I'm just curious. Uh, I said, I've been banished for your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. That is interesting. Okay. Yeah, so, um, so I often say, you know, there are lots of good Bible translations. The people who translate the Bible are a lot smarter than I am. <laughs> so even though I can read things in Greek and Hebrew, I often don't because I, I read an English Bible translation and I'm like, oh yeah, that was what I was trying to say, but a whole lot faster and better. <laughs> but we actually have an interpretive difference here. Yeah, um, my Bible says, nevertheless. Nevertheless. I yeah. Will look again. So I bet you what we've got is a reversing Bob. Let's look it up. Been banished from your sight. It says Ah, it is not a reversing love. It is of uncertain derivation. Surely, yeah. I mean, this this makes me think that. Uh, oh, the NRSV gave me a. Uh, Theodosian surely. Oh, so this is a wow. I'm sorry, I, I should have noticed this and I just didn't because I didn't look it up in multiple translations. Um, this is actually a textual variant. 
So apparently some, uh, uh, some Hebrew scriptures from which we translate um, the Bible have a word that means, um, that, that makes it a question. And some, some Hebrew scriptures have a word that makes it a statement. Uh, and so depending on kind of what your textual authority is, and, and my, my opinion with textual variants, I'm sorry, I'm deep in the weeds here. This is like, this is, you know, get your, get your bachelor's degree in Bible <laughs> stuff, not, uh, not normal everyday Bible study inspiration stuff. Uh, but I believe that usually when there are preserved textual variants, um, that God means something deep by both of them. Uh, and that there, there is, we are meant to ask the question, hey, which is better? Which, which is more interesting? Which, which illuminates the story more? Um, one of the most famous examples of textual variance in the Bible is the number of the beast, which we have all learned is 666 uh, in Revelation. Um, but in earlier contexts, in, in earlier texts in Greek, it's actually uh, 616, 616. Um, and it, there seems to be a reason for that because the, the number of the beast was meant to point to Caesar, was meant to point to um, the, the big evil guy of the day. And in areas where we find 616, it, they, they spell things differently and, and it works differently and it would point to Caesar in the same way that 666 did. So it's, it's doing its work in both contexts. It's not a mistake, it's a translation. Um, in the same way that we have, you know, versions of the Bible in English. Anyway, sorry, let me go back and uh, take you back. Let, let's get out of the weeds now. If, if those of you were, who were like already confused just, just on the surface level of Jonah, we have just dove deep down. Let's go back up to the surface for air. Jonah says, um, either uh, I, I am driven away from your sight and yet, I will, I am determined to look again in your holy temple. I will repent, or I wish I could repent, but I don't know how to. And depending on, I, I think, kind of where you are in history, right? Whether you're reading Jonah from before the Babylonian exile, after the Babylonian exile, after Jesus, um, those, those two perspectives are both good. Verse 5 says, The waters closed in over me, the deep surrounded me. He's kind of repeating himself from earlier. He's going back. Weeds were wrapped around my head. That is brutal. It kind of, you know, if you envision the nursery school classroom, you often see Jonah in the belly of the whale, sitting in a rowboat, fishing or reading a book. You know, comfortable in there. It is not a comfortable experience. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever, yet you brought up my life from the pit, O oh Lord my God. I don't love this roots of the mountains thing. Um, I think NRSV, I'll, I'll kind of show you. Uh, the water surrounded me. Yeah, to the moorings of the mountains, I went down to the earth with its bars behind me. It's a, in a weird way, the weeds and the roots, he's playing with weeds and roots. But it's also a, a, a beautiful idea that, I mean, it's, the, the Bible is taking you down below the waters, and it's telling you what it looks like under there. And it says, I, I, went, I went to where the roots of the mountains are. How do they even know? You know, like we've had Jacques Cousteau. We, we've had James Cameron take a deep sea uh, movie camera down there and looked around at the world beneath the waves. And we, and we know that there's, you know, these little 
curvy structures um, and that they continue straight up into the land and that's that's mountains you know if you if you go under under the water near Hawaii you can see Hawaii continue down like a big mountain um, and they're they're using that imagery I'm, I'm going down to the the moorings, you know, the, the places that the mountains are tied up, like a boat is tied up to the land. It's just a brilliant, um, it, it wants you, I think, this is Ryan in the white spaces here, right? This is interpretation, not just observation, not just reading. Um, I, I think the reason it does that is because it wants you to visualize, see out of Jonah's eyes, and therefore, to ask the question, what would it be like if I was there? What would it be like if I was deep underwater, the last moments of my life, right? Going down for the third time and, and seeing these things and receiving salvation, right? Suddenly something happens that means this is not the end. Um, that means, you know, I, I thought it was a period, but it's a semicolon. As my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord. And this is either, again, depending on which, whether you're doing a yet or a how in verse 4, this is either a repetition or a turning point. I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you in your holy temple. So Jonah's far away. He, he, he can't get to the temple from here. He's in a fish. But he says, I can lift a prayer up and it will reach you in the temple. Uh, David, you asked about the temple. Um, uh, I looked it up. <clears throat> yeah, it, it's a real place. Uh, it's, it's a, yeah. It says, <laughs> you know that yourselves God's temple and God's spirits lives in you. Mm -hmm. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. Okay. God's temple is scarce. You are that temple. Uh, yeah. I, so, so that is that is a New Testament concept. Jesus will will hundreds and hundreds of years later say, you know, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? But that is. That is post-Jesus. Jonah is pre-Jesus. Oh, and, and, I mean, he is, there is some metaphor going on, but for most Jews before Jesus, when we talk about the temple, we're talking about, you know, the temple. It's like talking about the capital. It's, you know, it, it is a landmark. It's a place that we go to visit regularly. Um, and so, uh, but he says, I don't actually need to go to the temple, which is... At the time, edgy, controversial, right? This is pre-exile. The, the first temple is still standing, Solomon's temple. And he says, my prayer can reach God in the temple, uh, even if I can never go there. That's going to be crucial, crucial, crucial when the temple is going to get destroyed. And, and the people are going to be carried off to Babylon, and they're going to say... Well, how can we sing a song to the Lord in a strange land? And they're going to look to the testimony of Jonah and say, well, when Jonah was far away from God, God could still hear him. So we're going to create synagogues. We're going to find a new way to worship God. We would love to rebuild the temple, but until we can manage that, uh, we're going to do the best we can. And folks, Jews are still doing that to this day. Um, they, they went back, Ezra and Nehemiah, they rebuilt the temple, then they got driven out from the land again, and from their perspective, they're still not able to rebuild the temple. The Dome of the Rock is built on top of it, and they can't destroy the Dome of the Rock. So they're waiting for the day they can rebuild the temple, and until then, they're doing the best they can. That makes sense? Am I, I, it, that was a big concept to just kind of bring up <laughs> nowhere, but I, I hope you're following me. Those who worship vain idols forsake their true loyalty, but I, with a voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. Now he's planting his feet. Now he knows where he stands. Through prayer, he's figured out 
I'm an external processor. Is anybody else an external processor? You know, it, it, you, you, ever, you ever have an experience where you're talking to someone and you say, well, how are you doing? And they're like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm, you know, it's just that, well, I spilled my coffee this morning and then I go with a tire indicator. And, and over time, as they keep talking to you, they realize they're really not fine. And they're like, thank you for listening. Like, I didn't say anything. I didn't, you know. <laughs> you're, you're such a great advice giver. Like, literally, you just talked. I, sometimes, just by talking to God, we kind of figure out where we are. We figure out what's true. God, this is not a conversation. This is not like Habakkuk, where God responds and tells Jonah, okay, stop, you're on the wrong track. God just kind of lets Jonah talk, and he's figuring it out. But with the voice of thanksgiving, I will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. Or you might see the word salvation. Same thing. It's an English word for a different thing. I don't love the word deliverance because it makes me think of dueling banjos. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it, it, it means, or that or pizza delivery. <laughs> but it, it means being saved, being delivered from my enemies. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And then the Lord spoke to the fish and it spewed. Jonah out upon dry land. Now, I've given the NRSV a hard time today. I love the translation spew. Um, the, the word in Hebrew is literally yaki. It's, it's an onomatopoeia. It, it's, a, it's a sound word, like bow wow. Um, and so they, they picked a, another sound word in English for... My Bible said vomited. Vomited, yeah. What, so that is, yeah, that is what happened. I, I, and, and I might even go the other direction, which is probably why they don't let me help translate Bibles. I might have said something like puked. <laughs> right? It's, it's this... Bounced. You know, the, yeah, the fish blocked Jonah onto dry land. Uh, so, where are we at? What do you think and what do you... Where are you going with this? What does this mean to you? He changed through him. He changed Yeah, to faithfulness. Yeah, to, to, to worshiping the Lord. And if the Lord can do that to me, I'm going to stay with you. <laughs> yeah. He learned his lesson. <laughs> Yeah, and he he committed. He he promised God. All right, I, what I have vowed, I will pay. In other words, all right, I'll go to Nineveh. Um, and at that moment, deliverance, salvation. At that moment, more. <laughs> Like, yeah. Isn't it amazing how much we are like Jonah? Yeah. Say more. <laughs> <laughs> we are just like Jonah. The Lord calls on us all the time. We say, no. Mm -hmm. I can't do that. I don't want to do that. Let somebody else do that. You know? Mm -hmm. The same thing Jonah was doing. And then we often find ourselves in the in the belly of the whale. Yeah. We, we reach we reach as low as we can go. Mm -hmm. Just with life, you know. Life takes us there, and we call out to the Lord. The being in the belly of the beast is a thing, right? Like we're we're familiar with that concept all over the place. Yeah. It's you you see that in the secular business world all the time. They don't realize they're quoting the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's a that's a relatable concept, yeah. right? I'm in the thick of it. I'm in the um, and and so often, um, Joseph Campbell is a really important figure in, in popular culture. Right? People who write like movies and 
fantasy stories um, often think about the hero's journey, where whether you're talking about King Arthur or Frodo or Luke Skywalker, there is this familiar cycle, or Jonah, of being called to something great, not wanting to go, passing a threshold, and then ending up in a crucible, ending up in a, in a get out of the frying pan into the fire, so to speak, but then being strengthened by that crucible, it being transformed by that difficult task, and returning changed, returning uh, refreshed. And, and the reason, all over the place, we keep telling those stories, we can't stop telling those stories. Every time you go to a movie, you probably are seeing some version of that story being told. Yeah. Um, is because that's our life, isn't it? Isn't that what your experience was like at, when you embarked on a new thing, when you went to college, when you began in your career, when you had your first child? Wasn't there a moment when you were pressed to your limit and then didn't you get past that moment and transformed? Mm -hmm. When I had cancer, and I talked to the Lord, and I was sitting in my chair in my bedroom. Yeah. And the song in the garden came to me, and it was the most wonderful experience. And I sailed through that, and now that's my favorite when things get rough. I know he walks with me, and he talks with me. But I can't tell you the feeling that I had. I, had, I knew the song from forever, mm -hmm. and it just came out of nowhere to me. Yeah, what a what a great. It was, uh, it was just something I tell everybody that I know you get tired of hearing it, but it, it's <laughs> so such a wonderful feeling, and I know you see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was. It was just. It almost brings chills to think about how wonderful it was. Yeah. Yeah. What a, what a great sea monster analog to th to think about cancer. Right? Mm -hmm. to, to stare death in the face, to, to be enclosed by it, right? Overwhelmed by it. My, my strength is not sufficient. Um, and then even the... I just found out. I had no doctors. I had nothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and the insight is the same too, right? Jonah says, God can hear me. And, and you're inside of in the garden. And he walks with me and he talks with me, right? God is with me in this. I'm not... I th Jonah thought he was running away from God. He realized in the belly of the fish, I can't get away from God. God is with me. Hey, God is with me. That's good news. Wait a second. <laughs> um, yeah. You know what you talked about? The mm -hmm. inner chair and the song came from her. I think in the Bible, there's one thing that's the hardest for most of us to do, where he says, be still and know that I am God. We're not good at being still mm -hmm. and letting God come into our thoughts and our hearts. We're in control. Yeah, mm -hmm. I am. <laughs> You're so right. And you know, we, we're we not very good at listening to him either. Right. We like to talk to him all the You got it. <laughs> but we don't want to be still and listen. I, I feel like chapter two is a really interesting opportunity to meditate on gratefulness and mourning. Gratefulness when things don't go our way, right? When, when bad stuff happens, when I'm at the end of my rope, when the, when the battle, because that song, I, I, it, the context is warfare. And the line is, be still and know that I'm God, right? When, when, when the waves are crashing over me, and yet, wait a second, how do I react to this? How do I, what do I want my posture to be? And, and can I find a way to have a posture of worship? Can I have a, find a way to have a posture of glory to God? Um, I, 
you know, lately, I, I think everything uh, it seems to relate to me to the pandemic, right? I think in a lot of ways, um, the pandemic has felt like being swallowed by a big fish to a lot of us, right? You're in lockdown. You can't leave. Um, you're stuck. What are you going to do? And in, in what ways can we see that as a means of salvation, a means of grace, uh, even as it is a means of inconvenience and the weeds are wrapped around our head? I feel like Christians are bad at that. I, I feel like, you know, the, the top 40 worship songs don't ever have the... the my life is going terribly, but God's still good. <laughs> it's, it's always, you know, th thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you, Lord, for making me happy and rich. Um, and we don't often have this, um, things aren't going my way, and yet I will praise you. Um, I, I have ruined everything. Um, and that's taught me a really valuable lesson. <laughs> it's it's just a it's it's a fascinating testimony. It's a fascinating position to be in. But I uh, go ahead. You you were about to say something smart, and I was I was just continuing to blather on. Let's let's hear the smartness. <clears throat> Stop smart. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm just looking. The thought came to my mind that. It, the belly of the fish was his seminary training. Mm. In school. <laughs> that, going to seminary can definitely be a kind of, oh, <laughs> a, a belly of the fish. I, <laughs> but the but it, it taught him, yeah. His experience, it gave him courage to face the Ninevites. That's right. And, uh, and he knows God will be with him. Mm -hmm. He was with him in the fish. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have to worry about these Ninevites. Because they were wicked people. And yeah. One man who went out there to do that, and I thought during that time, Jonah could look back and say, "Yeah, if I went through this, I don't have to be afraid of this." Yeah. This stuff just came to me. Yeah. Is, does Does anybody with a different career background have a similar crucible experience? You You talked about seminary. I also think a lot about like first internship, right? Where I just feel like I'm thrown to the wolves. You know, getting getting thrown in the deep end. Did did any of y'all in your careers have a have a kind of crucible where you were like, it's all on you? <laughs> Go ahead, David. Uh, I remember when I was <clears throat> in my thirties, uh, I was kind of scared doing a job career change, and uh, that kind of scared me. Now, I finally did it, but I was I was never survived doing it. Career change. Mm. Yeah, it's it's hard, but it's good training. Go ahead, Dave. I got asked at the last minute to lead um, a sunrise service for Easter. Did I know I was going to be doing that? The guy said, "Here's the stuff you're going to talk about." It's on you. See you. And I could there was not nowhere to go. Everybody's sitting there. Oh, are you? So I had to reach in and find the courage yeah. to continue. And I did. And after it was over, I had to go sit by myself in a quiet room for a little bit. I think it's a What just happened? <laughs> it's like we're having an out-of-body experience. Yeah. yeah. I love that, yeah, like it, like an out-of-body experience, right? It almost feels like your your body is performing without you. Mm -hmm. And and this, I see that in, in this text, mm -hmm. right? Jonah's doing something very uncharacteristic of Jonah, of, of everything we've learned about him from chapter 1. Jonah's the guy who's, you know, selfish and, and whiny and, and disobedient, but at this moment, he's kind of, despite himself, faithful and right and true and even brilliantly artistic, you know, at the roots of the mountains. It, it, yeah, God's kind of working through him. And then he comes out of the experience and he's covered in spew. 
Um, but he's alive and he's changed. He's never going to be the same again. He knows he can do that now. Uh, we got a couple more minutes. I want to talk about one other thing that I think is, I, I want to kind of prime the pump for next week as we go into Jonah 3. Because in Jonah 3, Jonah's going to preach. Uh, so, first Jonah ran from God, then Jonah prayed to God, now Jonah's going to preach the word of God. And I feel like in all of these chapters, the, the testimony of Jonah, Jonah's experience, is the main text, the main story. When he's on the boat, uh, he doesn't quote any scripture, he doesn't reference Torah, he just says, this is what's happening. You see the storm? It's because of God. Um, and the sailors see it, and so they say, all right, we believe. We're going we're gonna to make oaths. Similarly, Jonah in chapter 2, he's all alone. There's, there's no other characters to interact with here, and yet his experience is transformative to himself. And, thankfully, because it is recorded, through our ability to read it, Jonah chapter 2, I think it's transformative to us. The emotions Jonah is feeling, the sights Jonah is seeing, again, without any Torah, without any other scripture, without any uh, cited sources, just the fact that, hey, it happened to Jonah, that's enough for us. And next week, Jonah is going to walk into the city covered in whale guts. <laughs> And guess what? They're going to believe him. And I think a large part of why they're going to believe him is because he's going to be covered in whale guts. <laughs> right? They're, they know he's got something important to say. <laughs> because he, his own body is the evidence. His own body, his own experience, his own story is what makes him worth listening to. Not the fact that he's faithful, not the fact that he's wise, not the fact that he knows a lot. He doesn't seem to be any of those things. But he's got a story to tell. He's not talented. He's covered in vomit. What happened? I'm curious. Tell me! <laughs> and I think that's the same for you. I think that when you interact with people in your life and when you hope to influence them towards God, you can try to be really smart and you can try to reference authorities that you trust a lot. But oftentimes the people you're going to talk to are not going to care. But nobody can really argue with your experience. No one can really argue with your story. And so when you say, hey, this is what happened to me, um, that has a different kind of authority. That, that has a different kind of uh, winsomeness is uh, a word that's often used. It, it, it lands on people's ears differently. And, and including stories like Jonah that are about mistakes, that are about uh, how, how unworthy you are and how... I, so I, I just want to highlight that in Jonah, and I think it's going to get deeper next week. That, you know, Jonah is consistently the focus of Jonah. It's a little bit selfish that Jonah's only worried about Jonah in the whale. But I relate to it. I'd be in the same boat. <laughs> right? Um, but often you and your experiences and your story is the most valuable thing you have to bring to people. And often you and your own experiences and your story is the most valuable thing you have to bring to yourself. Um, 
when, when we talk about those crucible experiences, we talk about what we've been through and how it's changed us. And then we face the next crucible experience. And we say, I can't handle this. Maybe God would like us to remember, well, you handled this, this, and this, and this. I was there for you then. Do you think I'm going to be absent next time? we got two minutes left. Any last words? I think you did a good job for one chapter that we just left. When you were talking about the song, that happens to be one of the songs we're going to sing this Sunday. Mm -hmm. It keeps me going. <laughs> As Dan knows, I want to sing every time we go sing the anthems. I don't know. Well, let's close in prayer. Does somebody want to pray for us, or shall I? All right. Don't everybody jump at once. I'll do it. <laughs> Lord God, thank you. Um, thank you for the, the wisdom that you have brought to us through Jonah. I pray that you would continue to uh, teach us through the words of this book. I pray that we would feel that impulse now that we've been... Uh, exposed and introduced to these words in a new context, in a new light as adults, to go ahead and open up the Bible again midweek and see if we can glean any more insights um, and help us to remember these things and bless us next week as we crack open chapter 3. Amen. Amen.